Welcome to In Studio. I'm your host, Jay Daniels. Vocalist and composer Sarah Partridge has been working hard on her latest project, Portraits of Wisdom, a musical history of women in STEM. That's the acronym for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. You'll hear more about that in a moment, along with some of the inspirations which have led Sarah to this point. We begin our conversation with the musical motivations growing up with her mom and dad. Growing up, you had a very close musical influence in your father. In fact, he happened to be one of your first influences as far as sharing music with you. What role did he play in your musical career? He was the major force because I don't think I would have come to appreciate music and certainly not jazz music if it weren't for my father. My mother was a great lover of music and of jazz, but... um, you know, really for her, it was all about Frank Sinatra. <laughs> for my father, he loved discovering new people. Uh, even even through my life as a teenager, where he started listening to people like Kenny Rogers and uh, Chicago, the band Chicago, he was always curious. So what I got from him was just the true appreciation of number one, jazz, because he loved the chick singers uh, mostly. But then moving on in life, he was the one who introduced me to some of my favorite people who then had a great influence on my musical life in general. Mm -hmm. And who were some of those influences, like the artists that you really connected best with? Chris Connor, June Christie, Dakota Staten, Sarah Vaughn. Those were the early ones. Ella Fitzgerald, of course. Um, though, be, because they were the, the women that he listened to. And then I didn't come to the male singers literally till I met my husband, like Joe Williams and Johnny Hartman. I, I had not really paid much attention to them. And I got away from singing for, for a very long time. I, I pursued an acting career. I majored in theater, you know, at college, in college and, um, you know, moved to Los Angeles, did a lot of work out there. And it was there at the age of basically 30, that I really started pursuing this professionally. I didn't come by it in the traditional way of music school to, you know, performing in my early 20s. I was performing in another way, not in, not really in this way. And the artists that you mentioned, there is one point I do want to go back to. The artists that you mentioned, say the Chris Connors, the Johnny Hartmans, that variety, what was it about their vocalizing, their performing that best connected with you? Was there, you know, an emotional or a special musical connection that you felt to those particular artists you mentioned? I think it starts, since it was at a very young age, like five or six, I liked the way they sounded. And then, of course, I would sing along with them and it seemed easy. In a way, if I had started with the men, like, it would have been more difficult. But since I loved to sing at an early age and I would sing along with these women, there was something particularly about Chris Connor and June Christie, who, by the way, sound very much alike. I know yeah. they hated to hear that during their careers, but you know what I'm saying, that I felt a comfort with. I loved their phrasing. I thought their phrasing was so cool. And I knew about that at a fairly early age. You're also a big fan of the Great American Songbook, as many jazz vocalists are. Uh, that is where just about everyone has a start, and that's where a lot of the vocalists start out. There was a particular composer whose work was, well, a great influence upon your career, and maybe you didn't realize it at the time. As you know, George Gershwin took the words of DeBose Hayward and uh, composed a great musical called Porgy and Bess, and uh, there was a song that is a standard. If there ever were one, it's truly a standard called Summertime. That one song played an important role in your taking music in a more professional direction. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, little did I know. Um, I guess you want to hear that story, Jay? No, let's, uh, let's talk about something. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an odd little story. And, and I do say it's, it's, it started out as a, a little tiny nugget that turned into something. Um, so when I lived in Los Angeles... Um, and I started dating my husband, we would, uh, for giggles, go to the improv on Melrose, uh, not to watch comedy shows, but to sit in their bar and watch people do karaoke. <laughs> um, 
And so it turned out there was like six of us who would go every week and just have a great time. And Gary, my husband and um, my boyfriend at the time said, listen, I know you sing. You've told me about it. You told me you've done musicals and everything. Get up and do something. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not doing it. I'm not singing to karaoke. I don't know any of these pop songs that people are doing. And no. And he said, well, you know, get up there. And then, of course, my friends joined in. Get up there and go find something. So I was like, oh, man, I guess peer I'd pressure. had a couple of beers. Yeah, a little, a little alcohol and a little peer pressure. <laughs> Let me go up there. Works every time. Absolutely. So I get up there and I thumb through the, the book and I find Summertime. And I, I knew that song. I grew up with that song. And I thought, all right, if I'm going to do anything, it's going to be this. And I did. And I got off the stage and my friends were all just looking at me. And I was like, oh, God, was it that bad? And then Gary said, why haven't you done anything with this? I said, what do you mean? I said, it's always been a dream of mine. I mean, this sounds like a stupid story, but it is the way it happened, you know. Um, and he said, you know, I think you really should consider it. This is the really weird part. At that point, I'm approached by a gentleman who says, um, are you a professional jazz singer? <laughs> I said, no. And he said, well, I got to tell you something. I, I, I know a lot of jazz musicians in town, and I'd like to help you get booked. That started the whole thing. That was it. Very unusual sort of fluky thing, you know, turned into uh, a very long career of ups and downs and, you know, learning a trade later on in, in life, which wasn't easy. And it was a confirmation for you on what you should be doing in your life. At that time, yes, and it was good timing because, you know, as I said, I was like 29 or 30 and my acting, um, the that whole thing was, was starting to fade, you know. In Los Angeles, if you're a woman and you like turn 30 and you're not pretty much of a big shot or a really successful character actress, it gets tough. And so things were starting to go a little bit south. I wasn't getting the work that I was. And this just kind of came my way. And not that I started making money at it quickly, but it took over that creative side of me. And I really took it seriously. And I really loved it. And I felt more in control. But I would say definitely your time as an actress, uh, I, I, I think it'd be safe to say you still use a number of those skills. You have to when you're performing. You have to draw on uh, those emotional depths. You have to draw on some of the things you learned as acting. Would I be you know, correct in saying that? Oh, absolutely. I, I think it, it very much helped me. I mean, I look at each song as a story that I'm telling. And, you know, there's a, a beginning, middle, and end to it. And yeah, absolutely, I think it's helpful. It was, it's also been helpful in, in performance, not just interpretation of a song. You know, there, there's, a, there's a sense of performance that, that a lot of jazz musicians don't have and I'm not criticizing them I'm just saying it's so much about the music that sometimes people are up there being rather unaware of their audience yeah and I'm very aware of my audience probably just because of my background that's all I'm saying 1998 was a good year for you because that was the year that your first album came out and uh, it's a uh, release called I'll be easy to find and uh, I would say that you were one of the first uh, artist that we parted with at Simply Timeless, who I was not aware of before my show. Uh, you know, I had a lot of learning to do. I still have a lot of learning to do. And I think I went in search of artists that I thought would be a good fit for the show, ones that had good talent. And I came across your work and you were gracious enough to send me all of your albums and you've recorded a number. Most of them contain standards, you know, the songs that we're familiar with. My favorite as you well know, is perspective, just the piano and vocal. And as soon as I heard uh, your recording of I'll String Along With You, I realized this woman is able to personally take the song and make it her own and do so in a very seemingly effortless manner. But it's not just your performance that people know you for. In fact, there were two albums that I'm aware of that included your own compositions, one of those was I Never Thought I'd Be Here, which was all of your own original works. But the most recent, before your current project, was a collaboration with singer and songwriter Janice Ian, Bright Lights and Promises. What's the story behind that? I'm a member of the Recording Academy, 
And around Grammy season, you know, people start pitching their works and, uh, you know, on Facebook. And I noticed Janice Ian chiming in there. And um, we friended each other. And that was that. But at that time, it, it sort of became a perfect storm. I'm going to try to condense this. Uh, I was thinking about, about what my next project would be. And I had decided that I wanted to take an artist outside of my genre and make a collection of that person's material uh, my own and put it into you know my genre, uh, reinterpret, reimagine, so to speak. And I just, you know, I had always liked her. I loved her hit at 17 when I was a young girl and, and I had listened to her not a lot, but enough to like her work. And I thought this probably isn't gonna work because she's so pop folk. I don't know what I can do with her stuff, but I started listening to this woman's repertoire and the, um, the body of work that she has written is astounding. And much of it early on was very uh, influenced by jazz. So I contacted her and I said, look, I'm thinking of doing this. You know, what do you think? And she said, wow, I think it's great. And uh, I'd like to be a part of it in any way that I can, because after all, I'm not dead. <laughs> and <laughs> That's I said, a good thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I said, wow, that'd be awesome. And here's my wish list. And the wish list included, you know, if it's possible to write a song together for this album, it'd be great. And she said, I don't see why not. Let's see if we can work out our schedules. And she had become a little familiar with my work as well. So it was a really good beginning that blossomed into a wonderful friendship. Uh, I feel like I have a true friend and a colleague. And we ended up writing two songs for the album. I flew down to Nashville and, um, you know, we wrote two songs in two days, which was pretty amazing and had a wonderful time doing it. I just had a great time doing this album, really did. And this was truly... Uh evidence of a progression in your career because now in 2020 you have ventured out a little bit further um you mentioned your love of stories and you love to tell stories whether you are simply having a conversation uh over a cup of coffee or it's a song that you've composed for an album and there is one that you have been working on for several months in fact it's a crowdfunding project in part asking your fans your supporters to make their own contributions toward this the project is called Portraits of Wisdom, and it tells the stories of several women in STEM. That's S-T-E-M. For those who are not in education or don't know that acronym, what is the significance of STEM? STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And the focus of this project is, particular, is women. Um, women are still under-recognized in these fields. There still are not enough women entering these technological and scientific fields, although it's much better. And I thought it would be really cool <laughs> to help inspire young girls, young women, older women, women everywhere, and people in general, the public at large, and tell the stories, these inspirational stories of these um, of amazing women who have made amazing contributions behind the scenes. I call them unsung heroes. And I've had a great time researching them, although it was very hard coming down, coming to the, you know, the 10 that I'm decided to write about. But wow, what the, the world is full of them. But what I really looked for was not only their, what, the achievement that they made, but the their life in general. If there was a story behind their life that was interesting and even a little dramatic at times, I thought that, that, that's, that's great. Give us an example of one of these women and their story. One of the songs I just recorded is about a woman that I think every kid should grow up learning who she is. Her name was Esther Pohl, P-O-H-L, Lovejoy. And Esther Lovejoy was born in the uh, mid to late 1800s. I can't remember exactly. She was the first female physician in the state of Oregon. She took care of a whole county of people. She then became a major um, player in the vote for women, a suffragette, and she started the Equal Suffrage League, which included women of color and all, you know, different 
types as much as there was in Oregon right then. Uh, so she was instrumental in getting the vote passed in the state of Oregon. But beyond that, the rest of her life was dedicated to being a physician around the world. So her global relief programs, her humanitarian efforts went on until she died at the age of 98. And she started something called the American uh, Women's Medical, American Medical Women's Association, which is a global association. And, and I wrote this song about her because I was invited to, I was commissioned to write a song about her for AMWA, is what they're called, their uh, Centennial Congress, which was last July. And I just think if, you know, there's so much more to her life, but there's just a small example of someone who no one really, who's, no one knows, but she did so much. And we should clarify, this is how uh, the album is presented, at least from the samples that I've heard. You know, these, these are full-fledged songs, you know, three, four-minute arrangements, and you are telling the story, but it's, you know, you provide the vocal accompaniment along with the ensemble. And so it's not like, you know, you're sitting there with an instrumentation behind you and you're just telling a story. No, these are songs that you have written about them. Um, are these, for my benefit and the listeners, are these solely your compositions or were there other writers that collaborated with you? There are other writers. That's a good question. I can't take all the credit. credit. So far, I have pr written music and lyrics to three of them, but the rest of them I am only writing lyrics to. So in other words, I've, I'm writing lyrics to everything, but not composing every piece of music. So I have my pianist, my drummer, um, my trombone player, uh, a couple of female composers, you know, writing, writing uh, the music. So it's a mix and match. I do find this to be a project in its own league. Do you know of any other project that has done something similar to this before? I don't. No, I do know that Karen Allison did release um, yes late last year that su the women uh, the women's suffrage album, which is in a similar vein, I guess you could say. Although I'm really looking to tell some stories. However, I should say some of the stories I'm telling are from different angles and are a little obscure. And I, if I may, just give you one other example. Yes. Sunetra Gupta. This is a woman who is developing a one-time only vaccine for the flu. The song that I've written is basically from the viewpoint of the flu and the cells that the flu attacks. And it describes what she is discovering through these two entities. So, and it's also written, um, she's Indian. It's also, the music is very Indian influenced. Um, so that's a little, little bit of a different take. I try to have a different perspective in each song, not just telling this happened and this happened. The only song I've really done that with, I think, is Hedy Lamarr, who was a, uh, you know, famous beauty queen, an actress, and also uh, a prolific inventor. I tell you what really intrigues me about this whole project, and it's not just the album itself, but it's how you intend to share it with others. Right now, uh, this is being recorded during uh, what you might call the home quarantine during the coronavirus outbreak. And again, that's why it's timely that you're talking about this researcher. Um, but your intent, uh, when you are able to, is to go to colleges and universities and institutions of learning to share with some of the students uh, the stories and ideas related to this album. Uh, so tell us about that and other ways that you intend to share this music. Yeah, I, I think it's important to not just put it out there as a jazz album, you know, for, for your listening pleasure, which of course, you know, I want people to do. But part of it is to help inspire and educate in one way. Music is an informal way to educate people. And what I'm finding already is that um, institutions have been interested because it is a different way of learning. It's not sitting in a lecture hall and learning about someone's life. It's appealing to emotional intelligence. And, uh, you know, music is a very powerful thing and can be a very, very powerful way of learning. So, yes, going to schools and uh, STEM organizations. Um, here's an example. The Lindsey Vaughn Foundation, Lindsey Vaughn, famous skier. She started a foundation that a big part of it is uh, girls in STEM. And she gives scholarships to girls who want to go into STEM fields and does camps for them. 
And um, they've been interested in the project, and I was going to be a part of their gala this year, which has been canceled because of the pandemic. But they're absolutely looking at a concert element later, you know, for maybe one of the camps that these girls are attending. Um, That's the kind of thing, you know, just this is a broad-based project, you know. But it's very personal for you, though. I mean, being a being a woman yourself, it's very important that you share the stories of other women who have inspired you with their own stories. You know, that's a, a great point that you bring up, because one of the reasons I wanted to do this is because when I first started sort of researching, I thought it would be sort of uh, cold, like, would there be any warmth in this? And what I realized in reading and talking to some women in these fields, you know, it's easy to talk to doctors because they're everywhere. They <laughs> have they have a passion that musicians have. It's almost like it chose them. It's a passion. It's not a job. And I connected with that passion that all of these women have. And that was really exciting for me. So, yeah, telling those stories um, is very relatable. With regard to your passion for music, would you say it was the same for you as far as that's something that chose you rather than you chose it? I think so. Certainly the theater was, and this was, this was, this has always been with me. I just never really explored it <clears throat> because I didn't think I could, could do it. Um, but yeah, I absolutely feel that way because there are definitely better ways to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> but but what you do, though, is very fulfilling, not just for yourself, but for others. Uh, you do still offer private lessons in home, and uh, under normal circumstances, you would be offering in-studio lessons as well. Um, this, this whole talk about stories, uh, sharing the story of all of these women on your project, how has researching their stories, how has sharing their stories on the album impacted your own story not just musically but your own life story i think it's it's expanding my life i am meeting and talking to people i never would have met before i'm talking to women scientists and meeting um you know executive directors of foundations i'm meeting some incredibly bright women completely outside of my field that wouldn't have happened So that is a real gift. Our friend Sarah Partridge, this week's in-studio guest from Simply Timeless. For more information about her latest project, Portraits of Wisdom, visit the website sarahpartridge.com. Until we meet again, I'm Jay Daniels. Thanks for joining us in studio.